Hello. This is Chapter 6 of the book by Dr. Larry Van Hook, called, The Fourth Wall. In this chapter, our main character interviews a deceiving spirit, who is much different than the chilling one in Chapter 5. While it is a short chapter, the author uses this plot device to demonstrate how the evil unseen world attempts to entice people with stories to their liking rather than God's true grand narrative. And, as always, help us join the public square of ideas by liking, subscribing, and sharing. Chapter 6 Examples of Deceiving Spirits We began to fly to my great excitement. Everyone wishes they could fly when on earth, and now I was, unbound by the constraints of my former body, flying high and very fast. Where are we going now? I asked. Douglas, Michigan. We were above the swirling cloud line by then, but I did not fear holding Ariel's hand. A passenger jet flew westwardly beneath us quietly, reflecting the bright sun above. At this height, the atmosphere was palpable enough to sense our movement, but the expected rush of wind was strangely absent. It was a stillness amidst our speed. It was more than the sky. We were flying between worlds. We descended into a small, meticulously landscaped lawn with a scattering of wooden benches. A large metal-gated arch was guarding a nearby church courtyard. The edifice was modest but had a tall, steeple-like structure, narrow, ornate stained glass windows at the base, and an unassuming wooden door. We entered the sanctuary and found ourselves surrounded by traditional wooden pews holding dozens of parishioners. Towards the front, a curtain served as an altar backdrop with a door on each side. To the left was a black grand piano, and beside it stood a man who appeared to be their pastor. He was kneeling in prayer, his hands raised towards the crowd. He wore a rainbow shawl draped around his shoulders and sported a short beard that gave him a friendly appearance. Before I could take more in, Ariel said, Wait here. She walked up to the front and stood next to the praying pastor. I was glad that no one could see her. Imagine the ruckus if people saw an angel walk calmly up the aisle and stand next to their pastor. She suddenly grabbed through the pastor and pulled out what appeared to be his doppelganger by force. At that moment the real pastor lost his train of thought for a second but continued his soliloquy. Ariel dragged the pitiful spirit down the aisle back to me. This demon was pusillanimous and compliant compared to the venomous Obizuth. He complained, kicking and screaming as we dragged him into the courtyard. Hey, I was busy, let me go, he protested. With an angelic iron grip around his neck, she held the spirit there and said to me, Time for another interview. I asked, Is this what you call a deceiving spirit? Ariel nodded. Yes, so remember that. I asked, But why does he look like the fellow in the church? They take on the appearance of their obsessions, then over time they introduce their doctrines, or alternate stories, she replied. The demon spirit yanked to return to the building, but Ariel held him fast. Let me get back. My obsession may tell them something right, he pleaded. What is your name, demon? I commanded. I had a hunch that it would not be his real name. I call myself Salvatore now, he calmly said as if resigned that he would be delayed about his business. I was taken aback. That did not seem like a name for a demon. What is your business here? I continued next. I am doing my job spreading an excellent story. It is much better for you humans than God's story. I looked at Ariel. She was shaking her head. She had heard this line before. Ariel commanded him, Tell him what you have been feeding these lost sheep. She turned to me, adding, Every word of it will be a perversion and lie. It is a good story, he protested with a bit of a whine in his voice. This demon was passive and weak in his demeanor. He did not fit the stereotype of a frightful and awful demon. He looked like the pastor with his dark hair and a salt and pepper beard. You, old man, don't need Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he said, using air quotes for Lord and Savior. 
You need to be enlightened to your true, divine self. Ariel laughed. It isn't funny, he said, with a little hiss escaping through the mask. If you of five years ago wouldn't view yourself today as a heretic, you didn't grow spiritually, he snapped at me as if to punctuate his point. Now, I laughed to his chagrin. You must have a reason for recording me. Is it because I made the best story? He smirked a bit. I have them being inclusive and acting lovingly. Isn't that good? You misunderstand verses like John 3.16. Many of you Christians think it means you must accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, or you will be condemned to hell. That is a bad story. I give them what they want to hear. That is not what Jesus is saying in today's gospel. He paused a moment to take in his brilliance. You demons act as if I cannot see or read, I said incredulously. He laughed. Many of you humans can read, but... Just don't. It is easier to listen to me. Didn't Jesus refer to himself in the third person? He said pedantically. That is because when he said that those who believe in him will have eternal life, he wasn't referring to himself. He was referring to the Christ spirit that created the world. He must have been a narcissist if he referred to himself like this. No, Son of God and Only Begotten are terms for the Christ. God has eternally been begetting sons. The Christ existed billions of years before Jesus of Nazareth was even born. When God said, Let there be light, there was the Christ. Divine DNA was infused into all of creation. See, I'm giving him a good story. His words are mine. It sounds like a lot of gobbledygook. I said with a frown. Yes, to you, maybe. But these people eat it up. It is why I think my story will spread more than God's. I think that is why I will win. What better story is there than you need to wake up and realize that you are a god? Yeah, write that down. I know you are dead already, so write it. It will be proof of my triumph. I will rise to the highest when I am done. Belial himself will let me join his editorial staff. He laughed proudly. You will not overcome God's story, I affirmed. What? Right now there are readers of your story scoffing at both. Ha! Huh. Let's see who will win. After saying this, he asked Ariel, Can I go? The pastor may mess up my story if I don't keep tutoring him. No, she said. Exasperated, the demon continued. My story is that God so loved the world that he gave us of its very nature. This is what I tell the pastor, and he tells the gullible. He tells them that you are all sons of God. You are all gods. None of that is in the Bible, I argued. I can read it for heaven's sake. For heaven's sake? The Bible, as rightly interpreted, is my story. The Bible is just a tool to help us understand the world. It says what I tell them it says. Besides, they don't believe it anyway. They have itching ears. So it is easy to scratch with them my excellent story, he said. Jesus himself had an awakening that he and God were one. This helped him manifest this cosmic Christ and taught others to follow this way. You need to quit listening to your small self and listen to the divine Christ. This allows you to be who you are. There is no sin, just a false version of yourself. That is a better story because they don't have to do or be anything difficult. They don't have to hear God's harsh story. Mine is better. He said this, looking at Ariel for a sign he could leave. So Jesus didn't say he was the only way. He begrudgingly continued. Rather, he said, you are the world's light. You are all God's. All the things I do, you can do. Don't you believe Jesus? I believe in the Jesus of the Bible, I confessed. Sure, you do, he said sarcastically. You are an American and thousands of years separated from him. You believe in a modern version of Jesus just as much as in my story. Your Jesus is a blonde-haired European, Ariel commanded him. Stay on your point unless you want to be here longer. Fine. If you believe that you are the light, that you are one with the Christ, that you are God's, you really experience salvation. You knew this in the garden. God lied, but we told you this truth. We are your advocate because we tell you that you are your authority spiritually. 
I allow you to speak ex cathedra about your sex, lust, and destiny. You are your own judge. Isn't that a better story? You are free and belial. God's story is nothing but a slave morality. Your alternate story is about replacing God with human beings? I rhetorically asked. No, that is your story. I'm just embellishing and justifying it. But here is the bottom line. God so loved the world that he gave you of its very nature so that all who believe in it will live a life of freedom. Love wins. Ariel released him. He stood for a moment smiling, facing us, took a few steps backward, and ran back into the structure with a gleeful wave. Why didn't we chain him? I asked Ariel, finally getting my chance to ask the obvious. Because these people have adopted him and provided him sanctuary. We do not pull up the wheat with the tares, she said, looking down sadly. Do you want me to write more about this false doctrine? No, she replied. They have the word. Let them listen to that. We have more visits to make.